Coming up on More Than Before. We're not robots. We have imperfections and there's so much beauty in those imperfections. You can't win them all. You're, you're just not going to be able to achieve that and you're going to run yourself into the ground. This is More Than Before with Nathan Cook. Hey everyone, we have an amazing guest and I am so excited to dive into his story. He is quite an amazing entrepreneur owning two businesses here in Oregon. He is the co-owner of Insomnia Coffee Company, Dapper and Wise Roasters, and he is the president and artistic director at Love Good Performing Arts Company. He is an incredible dad of five amazing kids. Uh, and most importantly, he has a huge heart for serving people and serving the community. Evan Aldretti, I'm so excited to have you on. How are you doing today, brother? I am doing good. Thank you so much for having me on. You know, it's it's funny. We've known each other for a while, but we were talking before we even got on. And it's funny because you see people from only one dimension. I've known you <laughs> from the coffee world for so long. And then as soon as I started to see you in the performing arts world, I was like, man, I think he's having a midlife crisis or something. <laughs> and yeah. it really, it really is. It's fun to get to know people on such a different level because you are really heavily involved in the community. And, and so I'm really excited to dive into that story. Where did everything kind of start for you? What was life growing up for you? What kind of childhood did you have? Were you the outgoing child? Were you the shy child? G give us a little bit of background mm. of who you are. Yeah, I will condense this um, <laughs> uh, immensely. I would say that as a as a kid, I would say maybe let's start at like adolescent, preteen ish. Um, I was definitely a strange child. Um, I wanted attention, and I, you know, and obviously junior hires have their. We all know that tropes. You know, they're awkward phases and I just was determined to carry my awkward phase on through um, life. for attention. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and I didn't mind it. You know, I used to say, my mom says I'm special. <laughs> um, so yeah. And I think that there has always been that part of me that doesn't mind being in front of people or being the, the weird one or whatever. Mm. Um, I have always been an extrovert. Um, I would say, I, I, I love people energy. I love being around groups of people for a majority of my life. I've, I have been very comfortable on center stage, you know, and, and, and facilitating conversation and, and being a part of the mix. Um, and that wasn't, that wasn't really different as a kid. And it was really in spite of uh, a lot of uh, tumultuous and kind of difficult things to explain over a podcast, but things that were going on in my childhood. Uh, so I think a lot of my extroverted nature came out of a necessity to um, create a facade for people to see um, that, you know, in spite of whatever was happening on at, happening at home, I was able to keep up um, the energy, the appearance, you know, of, of, uh, of joy and, and, and all of that. So, well, and I love that you say that the energy and that joy within the appearance, because that's something that I've always kind of noticed about you is you, you walk into a room and you're just a ball of energy, you're a ball of joy, and you want to bring joy into a room. And, and, and whether that's, you know, cause I've seen you walking into serious conversations, uh, you know, uh, at the roastery and, and even, even in those moments, you still have a lightheartedness when you go in and you still kind of carry that joy. I'm curious, uh, from childhood, what were some of those things that you picked up? I think you said it really well that you kind of wear this mask as a child, um, because you're not quite 100% sure who's going to accept you uh, for who you are. And so right. I'm curious, uh, how, how did that play a part in your life identity wise as your circles that you were running in? Did you, did you have a hard time fitting in with people? Were you a, a, an excellent connector? Were you a chameleon? Yeah, definitely not a chameleon. Um, uh, connector, yes. Uh, I would say I have uh, social ninja skills. Um, I, I like to read people and and try to figure out where the conversation can go. Um, mm -hmm. And I have been someone who can make really friends with uh, any type of personality. I've been told several times by 
<clears throat> by my wife or people that are closer to me. They're like, I don't even know how you can be friends with that person. It's that is a tough person. That's a tough nut, right? And to crack and and there, you know, friendship is a sphere of you know uh, that has many levels to it and layers to it. I would say that you know um, there is an openness to me, um, depending on the type of person that they can perceive. Mm. Um, and, uh, some, and, and honestly, that has really translated into how we created like the feel at insomnia and what, um, you know, cause we have every single kind of customer and demographic that you can imagine, um, at, at the shops. And, uh, and I play that game in front of my, you know, in front of my baristas for them to see, you know, every, every single person, you can cater that experience to their personality and all of that. So that things ha that has been, that has transcended from my past, you know, just how I communicate in larger groups or, um, or even just one-on-one -on -one mm. with different people. And I, and I think again, if I, if I got, I get approval, if I get approval and affirmation from every person, um, and you can't win. You can't win them all. I know yeah. this. I mean, this is a precursor to where I am now. But, um, but if I my my goal was to just really be on everyone's good side, mm. um, and not to not to make this a super dramatic drop. But I had pretty dangerous people in my life um, as a kid, and one particular man that my mom was married to, and he uh, again, I won't go into details, but because. He had a dangerous nature to him. I felt you, you, you know, as a young man, you have two options, you fight or flight, you know? Um, and, uh, my, my goal wasn't to fight cause I'm not a fighter per se. Um, but I definitely can manipulate a conversation <laughs> and a relationship. <laughs> and I, I mean, I used to shy away from that word. It used to be a a four letter word to me, manipulation, but it was, a uh, as I've learned through counseling and all of that, it, it is really a, a tool that I had to use to survive my childhood. And, you know, so the people that are harder to deal with, more challenging to deal with, um, I kind of know how to speak their language. So how did you get into the coffee business? Cause if, if I recall correctly, that was not the original tent. That was not the big dream that you had in life, uh, you, you had other interests. How did it transition into coffee? Because coffee, I mean, it, it is definitely a culture. It's a community, especially when you get into it. What drew you to that? And, and how did you get started in that? Yeah, so the coffee world um, was due to my wife. She, when I uh, moved up to Oregon, um, in 2004, um, she had at that point been working for a small mom and pop, uh, coffee shop that was, that's actually still there in Aloha. Um, and, uh, and she had been working there for like six years, six or seven years at that point. Um, and she had just, I mean, it was different cause I'm a Southern California kid. Right. So, um, all we had was really like Starbucks and, and all of that, like the, the chains that I recognize, really very small yeah. uh, and and my my understanding of coffee was pretty small too um and then when i came up and saw this line of customers that were like waiting in the morning um in their cars and then amy just going crazy with the getting those drinks out super fast and the customers just adoring her to death like giving her things through the window i'm just like wow this is so cool that she knows all of these people and what their <laughs> drinks are and all of that stuff it was just a mind you know, uh, bending moment. I just, um, uh, definitely changed my perspective, um, on coffee. Um, and I was classically like my first like drink was like, uh, that I was like, Oh, I love coffee was sadly like, a like a very sweet, uh, like probably peppermint white chocolate, mo uh, mocha or whatever. And I remember getting Dutch brothers for the first time, you know, when I was in my early twenties and all that. And I was like, Oh man, this is killer. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, and I, I definitely have evolved, um, palette wise, but, um, but yeah, I, I would attribute our start to, um, watching that happen. And then, so with, with her being, um, working there and her dad being a small business owner and Tyler, 
um, and I had traveled. Oh gosh, I didn't even talk about the Continental Singers, but we used to, we all three were in the organization called the Continental Singers, right? And so we would travel all over the country uh, and sing and dance for, you know, five weeks to nine months at a time. That's how we all met each other uh, separately. Tyler, I, uh, when I moved up to Oregon to get married, I invited him to come and be my best man. And also, you know, you should live here because Portland's super cool. Um, and he's from Virginia. So that's kind of how all of those things uh, collided. You know, him coming from the East Coast, Amy being in coffee at that point, and me moving up as a as a uh, an aspiring artist, um, but also working like a call center job, <laughs> you know, um, which is classic, right? Um, yeah. And, and some waiting tables too. Um, so all of us um, have these like, um, oh, I didn't say that my father uh, or my stepdad at that time was a small business owner. And Tyler's dad is a small business owner. So we had these three um, families that, came from entrepreneurs and um and so we're like we we could do this and we could even just like uh make it awesome you know um one of the the i guess events that like kicked this off is that i convinced the two of them tyler and amy to be in a musical with me in forest in the in uh, theater in the grove and forest grove and um and let's just say that the um <laughs> The production wasn't the best. Um, and so we would spend a lot of our time uh, after rehearsals kind of like uh, hemming and hawing about how um, junky this rehearsal or this show is going to be. But we would do that at McMenamin's and we would be there. You know, we close them out downstairs in the ground lodge, uh, just drinking coffee super late. And we're like, you know, we should we should open a late night coffee there. I mean, we have to go to Vivachi in Portland, you know, they used to have that there. It's not even Vivachi anymore, but um, they used to do crepes and all that stuff. And that's where you would get, get late night coffee. And we're like, Oh, we should do something like that. There's no place in Hillsboro to hang out. Um, so that's kind of the inception of <laughs> how it started. <laughs> yeah. I love it. I love it because you, you really had this perfect mix. In fact, I think I recall Tyler even saying, you know, your wife was the coffee expert. <laughs> He was the business expert and you could sweet talk anyone. Uh, <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> which yeah. which I, I truly love because it, you 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 all have your varying degrees of of wisdom and uh, of like concentrated knowledge and, and to come together to do that is, is is quite remarkable. But at the same time, you know, a lot of people when it comes to entrepreneurship, they think, oh, well, you know, it's it's going to be fairly easy, like to get started because you're really passionate, which is true. You have a lot more energy in the start. Like, you know, the first six months, you guys were putting in hundreds of hours. You guys were running that place just by yourself, being the barista, doing, doing everything um, yeah. from, from your first location and baseline. And so I'm curious for you, what were, what were some of those early on lessons that you guys had to learn mm. going into business? Because some businesses you go into and there's, there's a rough learning curve, but it's survivable with a coffee shop. There's a lot of investment that go in to a coffee shop that a lot of people sure. don't think about. What were some of those early on lessons that you guys had to learn mm. and actually help propel you to where you guys are now, where you guys have six locations mm. all across mm -hmm. Oregon? I mean, it's, it's pretty remarkable. Well, working a hundred hour weeks was, um, I mean, I wouldn't, you know, someone would say I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy. Right. I feel like that was so necessary for us, um, to go through that season of just really, really hard work. I mean, it has, it had sacrifices to it, but being in the business, knowing every single thing that's happening um, even recognizing, um, all the transactions, like nothing's a surprise, mm -hmm. you know, like, um, looking at our day, you know, whatever, a $300 day, our first day or second day, it was like, Ooh, if this is going to be it, we're not going to be able to stay in business, you know? <laughs> and I remember celebrating our first uh, $1,000 sales day, you know, and all of that, but you know, it felt like our finger was on the pulse. Mm. Um, we knew everything, everybody was coming in. And not only that, I think the, that we cared about every interaction. Um, and even the ones that went sour, man, we just went to the nth degree to try to, to like make up for or remake a drink or try to, you know, again, I think this probably comes from me or, 
you know, but how can we salvage or make this even a, a more enriched like relationship with this customer? Right. Mm -hmm. um, when I, I mean, shooting forward to now your baristas and, and, and I don't blame them, but your average barista, like they hit close and man, they, they cannot wait to turn that close sign on, you know, or that op uh, turn the open sign off. Right. Yeah. And just like lock it up because they have, they are done. They've worked hard and they're um, they're ready to close it down for the day, but shoot back to the golden years, as I call them, it, we would literally like if customers walked up to the door and it was like a minute after closing, we would be like, it's okay. Like, come on in. It's fine. Well, they're like, oh, no, no. The customer would be like <laughs> very understandable, understanding, right? And they'd say, um, no, no, it's okay. I can come back tomorrow. No, 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 no. You know, no, please, this come, is in, just, come in. <laughs> yes. This is the kind of people that we were because we, we just wanted, I, I mean, it really comes down to we just wanted to make sure that they knew that we cared about um, our shop and that our reputation and that um, we're very nice and giving people, you know, generous people. So um, I, I feel like um, you, you can't sustain the, that for forever. And there's a reason why that is kind of like that sense of ownership mm -hmm. um, is placed on a, a, on a brand new entrepreneur. I recognize it very heavily um, and as I work with new, uh, new business owners. Um, and I, I, again, I don't take it away from them. I don't, I don't discredit it because it's so necessary to have that. Um, but eventually you have to recognize the sustainable efforts in your energy um, and really zero in on those things because the other things are just, you know, all of that energy of just trying to make sure you please everyone. It just, it burns you out um, mm -hmm. and you can't do it. So, and we're a big fan of the 80, 20 rule, you know, yeah. <laughs> so um, because you, you can't, you can't that 20%, man, you just can't do it. And I've spent years trying to, but yeah, yeah you can't win everybody over um, yeah. but you can definitely still care and do the 80% really, really well. Well, and I love that because when you walk in, when you walk into an insomnia coffee shop, or if you, if you walk into the roasting, the roasting room to get some coffee, you know, one of the things I love, and you can truly see this with insomnia, um, you walk in and the culture is so rich. And if you walk into a company, um, you have to understand that company's culture is a direct correlation to the person who runs it and the person who owns mm -hmm. it, especially yeah. if they are heavily involved. And, and you and Tyler are both heavily involved in both businesses. Now you've, you've taken a step back a little bit because you have other right. things that you're doing. However, you walk into that culture and you realize that there are two things that are high priority. One, it's the quality of coffee, extremely high. Two, it's the quality of relationships that they're constantly building. They, they build a community around coffee. Like coffee's mm -hmm. there. They want coffee to be an excellent, an excellent experience, but they also want the community and the relationship piece to be huge. Yeah. Excellence, Absolutely. I feel like, is a huge aspect of your life. And mm -hmm. uh, and um it, it's funny because I've had conversations with a couple different people recently, and they say, you know, um, I struggle with this idea of excellence because I hear excellence and I think perfection. And uh -huh. as soon as I get into perfection, I can't move forward. I get stuck. Mm -hmm. And so I'm curious for you, like even, even in performing arts, if you struggle yeah. to have every single line absolutely perfect and everything perfect, you can derail yourself. What totally. is that fine balance between perfectionism and excellence for you as, as you live life day to day? Mm, I love it. That is a great question. Excellence, um, I think that uh, it, it points really back to the nature of humanity. Um, and we're not robots. Um, we, we have imperfections and there's so much beauty in those imperfections. Um, and there to strive to be in a season of striving for, um, perfection, um, again, comes back to that thing where I'm saying you can't win them all. You're, you're just not going to be able to achieve that. And you're going to run yourself into the ground in every area of life. And that that's not just business, man. That's parenting. Um, that's your relationship, uh, like your spiritual relationship. You know, like there's there's so many things that that applies to you to try to to try to be perfect. True excellence is the, is the full gamut. Yeah. Um, is, is the ability to, and if you look at a, a good comedy, right, a good comedy sketch or, or some, something that's written, 
what they point at is not like if they were to try to line out line by line what is supposed to be said and how it's supposed to be delivered, et cetera, then it, it's really cookie cutter. And actually, um, you're going to miss a huge part of your audience. Um, it doesn't feel the, natural. The, no, it doesn't feel natural. The best thing is you're going through this comedy sketch or you're going through um, uh, even just a drama. And you recognize the things that are imperfect and you recognize the, the aspects of humanity that are there um, that people would um, resonate with and, and recognize. And then that's when you win in that, in that scenario or in that scene because people are like, oh, that's just like me, right? So uh, making yourself uh, unattainable uh, or inaccessible it, uh, by striving for perfection is just um, it, it actually alienates um, the people mm. that you're trying to be in a relationship with. I feel like it doesn't allow that uh, bridge um, in relationship. It just says, Oh, they're, uh, they're just, you know, they're so amazing. Um, <laughs> um, and yeah, anyway, that's, so there's to me, both performing arts and just in pursuing business um, excellence is just uh, it, it is probably a different definition for me um, than maybe some would put that in their minds. So, yeah, well, I, I like it because there's, there's kind of this piece where excellence says that it's okay to not have everything together. It just means that you're showing up as best as you can. You're, you're doing the mm -hmm. best that you can. That doesn't mean that you're happy with it. You, you know, you continue to improve and get better. But there's also, I right. love what you said about this, that there's a non-judgment piece of, hey, just come in the way that you are and it's completely fine. Yeah. You, wh wherever you yeah. are, you can improve that. That's great. But we're, we're just going to, we're going to allow you to come in and to, and to be here. And so I think of that almost in terms of coffee. Like I love that you were talking earlier, like your first experience with coffee was the sugar laced, uh, you know, coffee drink. Cause that was my experience. Um, <laughs> yeah. you know, my parents drank black coffee growing up and I couldn't understand it. Why, why are you, why are you guys drinking that? And the only thing, that, the only way you could get me to drink coffee was you had to lace it with sugar and milk almost to the point where right. I couldn't actually taste the coffee. <laughs> and in fact, it was actually a good friend of mine. Uh, when I originally started my career almost a decade ago, he's like, Hey, let's go to this coffee shop. And so we, we, we pull in and we were actually going to, uh, I believe it was Dapper and Wise actually, when you guys had your roasting room and we walked mm -hmm. in, and I'm looking at the menu and the menu had <laughs> three items. You had yep. your espresso, you had a, um, a cappuccino and you had a latte. That was it. And there were no flavors. No flavors. Yeah. So I'm looking at this board. I'm going, how am I going to drink any of this stuff? Like this, this, <laughs> this is going to be awful. Yeah. And I remember mm. reading it and, and, and it said, oh, I, I don't even remember what it was. Um, it, it said like notes of blueberry and, uh -huh. and there were yeah. some other things. Tastes and I'm nice. like, man, this is, <laughs> this is really over the top. They're really trying to sell this coffee. And so I sit down, I grab, I grab my little coffee cup. I got a little cappuccino and, you know, you do the little pinky thing because you feel, in, you know, uh, intelligent when you do that. <laughs> totally. And I took Absolutely. A sip. It's a must. I took a sip and I was like, oh my gosh, <sighs> this actually tastes like blueberries. Like the, there, there was a moment where my eyes opened up to coffee. And, and I think what's interesting is you you open up people's eyes to opportunities to experience mm. things, um, mm. experience coffee in a way that they've never experienced it, experience um, relationships in a way that they've never experienced them walking in and the barista knowing your name and smiling at you and, you know, not staring at their phone. Uh, right. Like yeah. th there is such an environment to all of this that you've created, which is, which is truly spectacular. I'm curious. I'm curious for this because I know there's a lot of sacrifice when it comes to business. There's a lot of business owners that listen to this, uh, a lot of entrepreneurs. And there's a point in your life where you have to start balancing family and business. Um, I, I've had one person say, you yeah. know, life is like a rhythm and you have to understand what that rhythm is. How have you been able to juggle both of these pieces? It, not even, it's not even just family for you and business. It's family, business, and the things that you love, like the theater now. How do you right. balance all mm -hmm. those things out? Yeah, it's, it is a great question. And I can't say that I have been perfect um, in this area, uh, especially in the earlier days. Um, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not a workaholic. 
And I mean, you know, the first line that says that you're a workaholic was when you say you're not a workaholic. I don't know. Maybe that's a, a, a thing. <laughs> Uh, but I, I'm not naturally a workaholic. I'm very much a, a delegator. Um, so I feel like in business or in organizations, I am, and in my relationships I'm forming with those people in those organizations slash businesses, they'll, people will recognize that I'm willing to hand over tasks, responsibilities, and kind of just develop them as a person, um, as a worker um, in that organization, because it's a two. It's a like it's two folded. I I get the benefit of seeing them grow and develop as a person, um, as a worker, and then it like frees me up, you know, to focus on other things. And again, there is a line there where um, business owners will not allow that to happen, and they could be in business, their small business or whatever, for a couple decades. I've seen it. Mm. And they still do not delegate because they're so afraid of letting some of those things go. I would say that I'm the person that ha that has the superpower of delegation. <laughs> With that being said, that has been the the I would say maybe the keystone habit for me to allow those things to happen so that I can free myself up for my personal life for my family. And uh, and be home at di at dinner time, you know. Now, in where the imperfection comes in is that because I am uh, because I'm an energy person, right? And uh, and I would say that I've many time many seasons of my life I've said yes to too many things, and that what ends up happening is those things absorb my energy um, when I when I'm delegating out uh, to. To, for for all intents and purposes. So I think that what I've had to realize um, is that time that I am giving away to other people or responsibilities that I'm getting, giving to other people. So I have time in the evening, in the morning, et cetera. Um, those, uh, those are to be used and prioritized in a way that fuels into my most important things, like my family, um, my, my time with my kids, uh, time with my wife. Um, and honestly, I, I really am there uh, at, this, at this junction of life. I get to spend a lot more time with my family than I feel like I am I'm almost embarrassed to admit. <laughs> Because I feel like I, um, I'm so blessed to be able to do that, to spend time with them. Now, I do have a lot on my plate still, but, but I, I am able to put my kids to bed um, almost every single night. Mm -hmm. um, and if not, it's like a pretty rare circumstance. And we have, our, we, our goal is to have at least one or two family dinners um, a week. Um, aside from our Sundays, which we just, we literally turn our phones off and we're not we're not accessible on Sunday. So yeah, I have, I can only do that because I've made the choice to hire um, really amazing leaders in our business to be able to manage things um, while I'm, while I'm out. So, and emergencies do happen like this morning, uh, you know, I wake up to, I told you uh, a little bit before this interview, I'm like, Oh, oh time, you know, um, things happen and um, they always happen on Monday or Fridays, you know, I am grateful to be able to, by and large, have a capacity for those most important things. Yeah, and you've and you've had to create that capacity too. And I think I, th I don't think a lot of people understand that you you create the capacity oh, yeah. that you have in life, and yeah. especially as as a high performer. And, and maybe you don't consider yourself a high performer, but I mean, when when you own two businesses and no, I, you're that's also. True. When you're when you're doing so many different things, you're kind of just you're kind of just operating, and you're you're doing what you're good at. But yeah. at, at a certain point, you actually have to start delegating. You have to actually start looking at everything and saying, "Okay, is this is this really serving the ultimate goal of where I'm going of what of what I'm trying to create?" And I don't think a yeah. lot of people actually spend time uh, actually processing of like, "Is this a direction that I should be going?" Um, am mm -hmm. I creating a capacity to live life the way that I really want to live? Mm -hmm. um, how, how do you, how do you, as, as a former recovering pleaser where I want to replete, I want to please yeah. other people. <laughs> um, how do you, yeah. how do you say no to people 
uh, in those mm. seasons? How, how do you get to that place where you can say no so you can increase that capacity? How, how have you done that? Well, like I said at the beginning, I, um, I'm, you know, I'm an extrovert. But I would say that um, it's less true now than it, than it used to be. I think I used to be fueled by that need, my need for affirmation from, from performance, you know, not in, in all senses of that word. After getting what I have received, um, the affirmation that I've received, accolades or whatever, over the years, people saying, your business is the amaz- amazing, your theater is amazing, you're amazing, all of those things. I feel like I, f- I find myself now drawing back from wanting, I mean, wanting that, wanting to hear it. Um, if I'm in a conversation with uh, somebody that's never met me before and we're just getting to know each other, maybe at church or something, I, I, I don't find insomnia or even love good on the tip of my tongue because I would rather get to know the person without them seeing this, my, like, this performance side of me or this part mm. of me that is like, that was striving for, um, for that kind of attention. And I, I, I think that COVID did that to me. I used to be quite a bit of an uh, extrovert before that. And I, I found that um, it, I'm still working through a lot of things with that, that time in our, uh, in our life. But, um, but I, I think that I recognize now um, what, what was fueling that extroverted nature. And now I, I'm actually very, happy to draw back and wait for those perfect moments to interject myself into society Mm. as opposed to being center stage or, um, and all of that. And obviously I have that skill set, and, and not a lot of people have it. As a matter of fact, I feel like the more I talk and meet with people, I find it's pretty rare that people want to step into the center uh, of attention. Most people want to not be in that spot. So I, I find that it's like something, a tool that I can use. Um, and then like, can you MC this or can you do this for us? Um, I am not jumping at those opportunities, but I am able to do them and, and really just find the perfect moments. I don't know, call that wisdom or a conservation of energy. I don't know, <laughs> but that's <laughs> kind of, that's where I am at this point. Well, I love that though, because it controls the narrative. Like so many people want to put their job out or what they do out first. Oh, and it creates the, yeah. it creates this presupposition of like, you know, hey, I'm the owner of this company uh, or I, I, I do this or I perform over here or, or fill mm-hmm. in the blank. All of a sudden, that person, no, no matter who it is, they already have that that preconceived notion of what they believe you should be based off of doing that. Totally. And and there's almost kind of this piece I find with with people who are high performers, who are really good at what they do, who do things with excellence. And most people would look at them and go, "Oh my gosh, they're amazing." And they look back and they say, hey, "I'm just an everyday person. I've I've just specialized and focused in this area." And I don't want to be known for just that. There are other aspects of my life that I want people to know. For you, you made a huge transition. I I would say maybe it wasn't a huge transition, but you started to shift your attention away from doing the day-to-day coffee and and roasting. And you made a shift to go back to something that you've always loved, which is performance. And I think it's Mm -hmm. it's almost kind of... um, I almost want to say it's kind of like a Cinderella story almost because it's, <laughs> it's, it's something that you put down, you, you put this down and yeah. you thought it was kind of the end. Like, okay, so I'm going to give this up mm-hmm. so I can focus on the business. And then, right. you know, 16 years later, uh, probably 14 years later, you come back and you start to breathe life into this. And it's no longer about ego of you building yourself up. Now you're creating an outlet for other people to take center stage, to develop their chops, to be able to experience something they've never experienced before. What has that process mm-hmm. been like for you stepping into uh, you know, the, the creative director position uh, of this performing arts studio? Like, What has that been like for you? Amazing in, in a lot of different ways and, and, and also challenging and, and very well put, by the way. Um, I love how you summar- summarize that. Um, C- Cinderella story, yes. So um, Cinderella, the, the before the gown, you know? So like we're at this like 
endearing Cinderella um, part of the timeline. And we have yet to be revealed as um, in our full glory. <laughs> um, but uh, we started Love Good Performing Arts Company in 2020. And just saying really that alone. Really year. Just, great, 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 great time to get great time you know, to, a bunch yeah. of people together in, a, in spaces. Like, it, just the greatest yeah. time ever. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, yeah, crazy. And, you know, every theater, every aspect of our um, of performing arts, you know, shut down. It was like, oh, we're moving online. And so whether you and actually funny enough, Ames and I were um, doing comedy sports all the way up to the minor league um, before COVID. And, you know, they started doing uh, online only for a while. And it's just sad. And it just felt like performance just felt sad and, and dangerous. And um, and it was so what a time to open up a performing arts company. When we did it, like I, uh, we have a mutual friend, Tim, who helped me do a virtual, basically, um, show. It was a musical, like a review. Yeah. Oh so we like individually recorded all of these kids doing their things and, um, in, in a mic and, and it was insane, but that was, um, and it was actually, we have this nice finished product, you know, um, that I'm so grateful that we, we are able to have and walk away with, but that's what, what, that's what it was like. You know, what I think is interesting is that it made us, um, you know, this is not a, about COVID, but one thing that was lacking um, in that time that maybe we took for granted was that um, that piece of connection with another person on stage. There's lots of different performers that have a, a varied amount of um, motivations for why they would put themselves on stage, whether it's financial reason, like because they're, they're talented at it and they've just been working at it. They have their degree, et cetera. And that's why they do it. Cause they're like, well, this is my field. Right. Or you have people that um, love the applause, you know, and they do it for the clap. Then you have people that they could care less if there were people in the audience or very few, they love and, and really relish the, the opportunity to act and to be on stage with another person and to work with um, a cast and to create another world. And that, um, that is something that funny enough, it's very similar to insomnia. You know, one, one thing that insomnia was, has always been known for is just being somebody's, you know, office space or living room, right? They're it's Hillsborough's living room. Um, because they're, you're able to just be somewhere else and feel comfortable there. If I can create these worlds with these, uh, with my students, um, where people can come in and they lose their sense of reality at least for an hour or two and, and just be captivated in another story and another, um, another place. And they feel like they are, um, that that's a gift to me, you know, that's a, to, to our community. That's, and, and not just to our community, it's, it's a gift to our, the actors because mm -hmm. then they can, they can, they can also, because the lights are shining in your face. And I tell them all the time, I know you don't have to be scared. You won't see anybody, <laughs> you know, the lights are so, um, so blaring that you, you also, get the privilege to be in another world um, with these other people and, and do something amazing. Play pretend for crying out loud. We haven't been able to play pretend since we were like eight or nine, you know? And then we like drop that like a bad habit, except for me. I mean, but um, <laughs> some people still hold but, on to it. They hold on to the dream. <laughs> and I think, I think it's important to, to be able to imagine and, and pretend uh, again, it gives you, it gives you some power over, over narrative, um, over uh, expression. Yeah, it's it's it is a it's a really cool thing to be able to do. They do seem like opposite worlds and they are different industries for sure. But the parallels um, in managing and running an environment and a coffee shop and a theater company are actually strikingly similar. Um, and I find my role between the two organizations very similar as well, which helps me manage uh to be able to do both you know because that's one of the questions i get all the time how do you do both you know yeah. and i'm like oh my job my job is very similar um and we have a, a newer staff uh, you know are new to like being a staff of a, a theater organization and it's a really tight team here at the theater and uh, one of my 
greatest privileges is leading leading them and teaching them to lead. Well, I love I love that you are kind of a creator of world, like uh, you're a creator of safe spaces for people to actually connect. And it's funny because when you were describing this this interaction that you have on stage with your cast members, there's an intimacy that kind of that takes place there totally. that you, that you trust the other person that you know that they're going to be there with their lines in their place. But then there's also like, even when you get into the improv side of things, now all of a sudden you're trusting that the other person is going to support you no matter what silly thing that you say. And totally. what, what's really interesting is you can find this type of connection in any type of environment where there is collaboration, whether that's in sports where you have to trust other people, you know, for me, like I was in martial arts for, you know, over 20 years and you, there's, mm. an, there's a level of intimacy when someone is hitting you <laughs> that, you know, that, <laughs> that they're I not, bet. that they're not going to hurt Can you. Like that, really like, feel the impact, <laughs> really feel the impact that they have in your life. <laughs> Oh, I love it. But w oh, whether that's whether that's you know in uh, in sports, whether that's in, in any type of theater, any like even in um, in music, when you are when you're creating a piece, there's a level of intimacy there. And I think I would almost go as far to say it's a level of intimacy that you even experience within the military. Now, I didn't I didn't serve mm -hmm. in the military, but when you are in community with people in a safe space and you're going through something like COVID. You created yeah. this space for youth, for people to come together to say, you know what? For so long, I've been wearing my mask everywhere I go. Now I'm going to go into this one scene, into this one place, and this is going to be the place where I can just wear the mask. And then I, it frees me to go out and be who I am. And there's a confidence mm -hmm. that comes with that. There's a confidence yeah. of having a space where you can just be yourself and i love that you right. create that it pretty much mm -hmm. with everything that you touch where, where wherever it is that you go yes um one thing my wife pays me some compliments every now and then <laughs> <laughs> and you know uh she's it's good to she's, know that she's, I, she's great it's, she's it's very not... supportive in every area of my life really honestly she is um uh, and one compliment, as I'll remember them, the compliments that she gives me is, uh, you know, as a director, like a, a, like an actual director, not just like overall director, but, you know, working through a show, um, she said that, you know, one of your greatest strengths in directing is creating moments. So a, a an ability for a director to get in the weeds with a certain transition of a scene or a, a scene between two people, especially when you're blocking it and, you know, you give them, you know, you're kind of like you exit here, you come on here, et cetera. And then you trust that they will allow that moment to happen. However, sometimes people need, and a lot of times people need direction. Oh, uh, you know, they want to know, like, I am going to put myself out there and do what I think is natural or what I think we should do. But I'm a hundred percent open just to, for you to speak into this and say, what does that look like? How, how can we make this more impactful, mm. et cetera. And that perspective, you know, that outside perspective or, or um, a perspective as a leader is, is needed. It's wanted actually. And a lot of times people in society look like, Oh, they don't want to hear my opinion. They don't want to hear, how, um, how I think, you know, obviously there are people that are overbearing in this area <laughs> and, um, you probably can think of people that are just like, they give their opinion all the time. And you're like, okay, you probably, you know, um, <laughs> but for someone to, for artists specifically, it's such a vulnerable thing to put yourself out there. It's, it's a very wise thing for a director mm. to allow them to try and then just infuse it with perspective and, how um questions you know uh what do you want to get out of this what do you want what does your character want what do they want and and allow them to see it from different angles and then they can try something um and then you can like throw in little nuggets and they're like oh yes and then you all of a sudden you're creating this whole thing and which would normally be just pass or fly over you know you just fly over that scene because it's just like we're just going on to the next song but i i would say that it's those scenes that even though people can't articulate it and patrons can't articulate it when they're leaving the theater, they just feel good. Mm -hmm. They felt like that was an experience. And again, coming back to insomnia, people can't always articulate why they love to come in insomnia. 
or why they love to go to a particular shop. But they feel all the subliminal cues and uh, environment and all of that. They feel those things as they're coming in and entering or as they're exiting, and it feels right. Mm. And so they're like, I want to go back to that place that feels right. <laughs> <You know? laughs> So, well, you, you create a framework for people, you know, it's, it's kind of like, yeah. uh, you, you know, you, you build a house and you build it in a way that, you know, that people will be able to use it, that they'll <laughs> enjoy being in the space, but it's still a blank wall. They can, they can put what they want on, mm. they can paint it. They can, they can put their couch wherever they want. They can, you know, not necessarily put the window where they want, but you, you, yeah. you put things in a place where it opens up opportunity for people to truly be themselves. And I think that's what you do. Yeah. In every single aspect of your life, you create these opportunities, you create these frameworks, you create moments for people to just be who they were mm. created to be. And I think that's what's really powerful. You know, I haven't, I've, I've really loved our time just kind of diving into your story, diving into even to some of the philosophies of, of kind of how you live your life. You know, I have, I have one more question for you, but before I ask sure. it, you know, to, to everyone listening, I want you to, first of all, go grab some amazing coffee from uh, Dapper and Wise Roasting. Um, I'm, I'm, I have it right here. Uh, I drink it every single morning. It's uh, by far one of my favorite blends. I'm not being paid for this promotion, by the way. Uh, <laughs> but uh, truly, truly an amazing coffee that um, when you taste it, you say, man, there was a lot of love. There was a lot of thought that, that went into this. So go, go, go grab a bag of coffee. Treat yourself. Yes. And secondly, um, go check out Love Good Performing Arts Company in Beaverton, Oregon. If you're in the area, go check them out. Um, if you're not in the area and you're looking for a nonprofit that you want to that you want to support, um, you can support them uh, through donations. They uh, give thousands of donations out. I think uh, up to this point this year in 2023, uh, you guys have given out over forty thousand dollars of scholarships to different people, which is absolutely phenomenal, amazing. So. And that doesn't that doesn't happen without amazing sponsors who come in and, and and sponsor the types of shows that they're doing. So go check them out. Uh, go see how you can get involved and get involved even within your own community. Find find a local company, uh, performing arts company that is in your, in your yeah. community that's giving back. Absolutely, uh, I know that mm -hmm. would be something that Evan would love for you guys to do. Mm -hmm. um, Evan, uh, you've you've had great opportunities to pour into people's lives. And, and I didn't mean for it to come out this way, but you know, you've poured into life with coffee. You, 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 you know, oh, the puns. You, yeah, the puns that go on. You know, I'm a dad. That's where it comes from. But you know, you pour yeah. into lives with your coffee. You you pour into lives within uh, performing arts. Uh, I know you have five kids that you pour into every single day, and I know that they're a joy to you. How mm -hmm. do you nurture the spark of other people? Like, like, how do you, how do you take their dreams, the things that they love, the things that they're talented in, and how do you inspire? How do you, how do you craft an environment for someone mm. to truly start to be who they were created to be? Cause I know a lot of parents that I talk to and they say, you know, mm. my kid's getting into this, this particular thing. And, and I don't, I don't know how to encourage them in this cause I don't know how to write. I don't know how to sing yeah. uh, or play the piano or roast coffee or, you know, mm -hmm. do welding or w whatever it is. How do you yeah. nurture the spark in someone else's life? Mm. Well, this, um, easy, questions, every fine, right? <laughs> yeah. Easy question. Gosh, how do, where do I come at it? Uh, I would say the greatest aspect of, um, of leading or being, or just aspect of life is being a, a father to my kids. They are the greatest joy to me, e even in the worst of times, uh, uh, the worst of emotions and all of that. And I have a teenager and I have two more coming up in the teenager, but I'm just saying like, they are just the greatest joy for me. And they are so unique from each other. And they're, you know, having five kids is, uh, it, it could be, it could be tricky because having large, I've seen families that have lots of kids and then you get the lost kid syndrome, you know, the one, the one that is one that like, got away. <laughs> uh, yeah, the one that yeah. got away. And, and, you know, there's lots of family dynamics that still are at play, but as a father, I guess my, my joy and my duty is to read 
my, my read my kids the best that I can on a day to day basis, not just like a larger assumption, um, because things change from day to day and and really just get a read on where they are and check in with them, love them, give them space. And um, and I think, you know, when we got to get stuff done, we got to get stuff done, you know, like but thrusting that on my family is never a good suit for me to say, Oh, we got it. Oh, you know, it's just not good. Um, so just careful, like to give, um, you know, a heads up and, or maybe eight reminders of what's happening tomorrow night or whatever, you know, but all that to say, like, aside from just going and milling about as a family of seven, I think we, um, both my wife and I, we sit and banter back and forth on the fun, unique characteristics that each of our kids bring to the table. You know, even if they're trickier to manage or they're harder emotionally to manage, but uh, they all are so unique and one and wonderfully made. Hmm. Um, and it, it is our privilege to steward them in life, you know, uh, and to, to give them as uh, the best kind of love and perspective that we can speaking to my kids that really draws back to you what I was saying at the beginning as all of those years and decades of people, ninja, social ninja, you know, learning different kinds of personalities. It's, it has formed me into, and I'm not ashamed to say that I'm a great dad. I, I love my kids and they love me and I'm so grateful to be in their life in the, in the capacity that I am. I love the perspective that you have. Um, first of all, to create the space for them to be themselves, but then also the perspective that you have to look for the good in your kids, to, to, to talk with your wife and to say, Hey, did you see this? Like, this was really cool. And there's those moments. I think, I think we can easily pass up over those as parents. Um, you know, cause we, we get wrapped up in the day to day of, Oh my gosh, this is happening. Did you hear what they did? Did you see what they said? Or did you hear what they said? And you right. kind of get wrapped up in that. But when you stop, and you speak life over them of like, oh, did you did like just the other day watching watching my daughter helping my son? I was like, oh my gosh, like we're doing something right. Um, mm-hmm. Or or even um, we we were driving down to see uh, their grandparents um, this last week. We're driving back up and my daughter uh, from the back seat, you know, because we we've we've got three kids. So from the back seat, I hear, <laughs> Daddy, thank you for driving us all the way down to Grandma and Grandpa's. And my daughter's four and a half. Like, right. I'm like, ah, I can graduate. They can leave. Like, <laughs> this is. I'm I'm done being a parent. I like this is this is this is the best moment of my life. But you know that it all comes back almost to a perspective of are you looking for those opportunities? And I love that you yeah. say reading your kids every single day. I think that we don't read people enough. We get into this common space with people and just assume that their life is good. We just assume that maybe their life is always bad. And we never, we never actually dig deeper to say, Hey, what's going on in life? Tell me what's really going. How are you feeling about that? So I love the fact that you yeah. say reading your kids every single day. And it doesn't have to be like um, a full on half an hour, hour discussion, you know, and, and, and nor would they want that. I, I mean, some of my kids are just like, it's good, dad. You know, just, Give me some space, you know, um, but, uh, but, you know, like my son who's 16 going on 17, um, going on 12, um, <laughs> but uh, he, 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 I'm so grateful that he wants to spend time with me. You hear it all the time. Like, oh, once they get to a certain age, I don't want to spend any time with you. And my, my son is like, he, he relishes any time that he can, when I'm just sitting in his room or listening to his record collection or just talking, shooting the breeze. Um, and those are, those are unique opportunities that I just, I mean, I, I could fill my day with lots of things, hmm. but, um, but those are the rocks in the jar, as it were, you know, those are the things you have to put in first, because if you don't, you know, you'll miss that opportunity and um, they will miss it. Mm. Um, and yeah. Yeah. So giving that, giving that priority in the space for them is important to me. 
Well, and and there's something about the perspective that you have that if you say, "Oh, my kids are going to grow distant to me," like you're going, you, the more you focus on that, the more you're going to start to create those opportunities where they where, where they will. And I found yeah. that like the more that I see things like, "Oh, we're you know, I believe we're going to be a great family. I I I know that we're going to have great bonds, and we're going to talk about things, and we're going to be open with those with with anything that comes up." If you believe that, if you continually believe that and think upon that you start to create that in your world. And so if you want a good relationship with your kids uh, going beyond, uh, you know, adolescence, you have to start thinking that now you can't think, Oh, well, they're going to have their own friends and they're never going to talk to me again, because guess what? That's what's going to happen. But, (laughs) but when you actually start to think, you know what, my kids know that they, that I love them and that, they can come to me and talk to me about anything. And I create an open space Mm -hmm. where, you know, even if it's, if you have the opportunity to sit on the couch when they walk in the door from school and you don't even necessarily say like, Hey, come and sit down and have a conversation with me. If you create that opportunity, there is the likelihood that at one point they're going to start sitting down. And if you can start asking questions and listening, it's going to create a door of opportunity for you to actually spend time with your kids. You know, Evan, I love this time. It has been so good. It's it's so rich, the conversation that we've had. I want to thank you for coming on, inspiring so many people to grow in who they are. Find a space where you can be you, whether that's uh, mm. at, a, at a great coffee shop like Insomnia or whether that's at a performing arts uh, theater. I want, to, I want to encourage all of you guys listening, go find a place where you can be you. I know so many people have been really enjoyed this conversation i know that they've been encouraged with it so for all of you listening remember to like share subscribe and i can't wait to see you guys on the next episode remember to be more see more and experience more than before